This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. This is a basilisk. A cross between a chicken and a snake, it's equipped with deadly venom. As it roams the swamps of medieval Poland, it searches for its prey. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Medieval zoology is bizarre, mostly because half the creatures don't even exist, and those that do look very, very strange. I want to take you on a journey, highlighting the weird and wild creatures of European folklore, a world where mythology and biology blend together. In this handy field guide, we'll see why you should never pay full price for unicorn horns, and why this Christian saint has the head of a dog. Sit back, relax and enjoy. It's gonna get weird. We start in the south of France, with a ferocious beast known as the Tarasque. It's somewhere between a dragon and a tortoise, and looks a bit like Bowser from Super Mario. Now, according to some rumours, the Tarasque was the love child between the biblical Leviathan and a creature known as a Bonacon, a bull-like monster that shoots corrosive dung at its enemies. Charming. The Tarasque's habitat is on the banks of rivers or in deep caves, and it was known to swallow unwary travellers that came too close. According to a medieval French chronicle, Saint Martha defeated one by sprinkling holy water onto its head and then she wrapped a rope round its neck. She then led it to a nearby village, where it was clubbed to death by the angry townsfolk. For centuries, the people of Tarascon have held an annual festival commemorating this heroic deed. Even today, an effigy of the monster is paraded around town and beaten with sticks. A good place to look for medieval monsters is in bestiaries, encyclopedias of all the known creatures in the world, real or imagined. This one, the Aberdeen Bestiary, is the most exquisite around. You can see all kinds of familiar animals in its gilded pages, like these ones here. But there are some creatures, like these, that do not exist. My favourites, however, are the real-life animals that are highly inaccurate. Elephants in particular, they are often depicted with castles on their backs. It's likely that the illustrators had never actually seen an elephant and base their drawings entirely on exaggerated descriptions offered by travellers. Now for some plant life. This is a goose tree. Yes, a tree that grows geese. When ripe, the eggs would hatch and drop the chicks down to the ground. Unfortunately, such a plant is not real. But the story behind this myth is fascinating. You see, for a very long time, no one knew how geese reproduced, as between the roosting months of October through to March, they were simply nowhere to be seen. What people didn't know is that these birds had migrated across the Atlantic to Greenland and North America, land that was not yet known to most Europeans. The myth sprung up to explain what happened during these months, as it would be a long time yet until the migratory patterns of these birds were fully understood. Perhaps the most majestic creature of all was the griffin. Believed to be the king of beasts, it has the body of a lion with the head and wings of an eagle. In the distant past, people claimed to own physical remnants of such monsters. This is the so-called Griffin Claw of St Cuthbert. It was allegedly found in the tomb of this Northumbrian saint. Surely this is irrefutable proof that griffins once roamed the skies. Well, no, not quite. These are not griffin claws at all. Flip them around and they're the horns of an ibex, a type of mountain goat. Physical remains of mythical beasts could fetch a high price on the market especially as they are believed to be magical. In 1577, Tudor Queen Elizabeth I was believed to have bought a unicorn horn to the tune of £10,000, which is worth around £2 million in today's money. What she didn't know is that there were in fact narwhal tusks that had washed up on the shore of Greenland. Talk about being royally swindled. We're lucky today that all kinds of knowledge are readily available. That's why this video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is an online streaming service with a library of fascinating documentaries. Think Netflix, but for 100% non-fiction storytelling. There are plenty of award-winning documentaries to go and watch, from history, nature, true crime and more. Pretty much anything you can think of. And with a constantly expanding library of exclusive shows, there's always something new. I've recently watched a series called The Biblical Plagues. Using historical evidence and archaeological data, it explores whether the apocalyptic events from the book of Exodus may have actually happened. If you've enjoyed my videos on biblical history, then this one will be right up your street. You can stream their shows onto any device, and even watch them offline, so you can expand your horizons on the go. If you use code HOCHOLAGA to sign up, 
You can access all of Curiosity Stream's online movies and shows for just $14.99 for the entire year. Head to the description below to get started. Thanks Curiosity Stream. Okay, back to the video. Taking to the high seas now, this map of Scandinavia is positively brimming with all kinds of strange marine life. We have giant kaiju-sized lobsters off the coast of Scotland, and near Iceland we have a so-called sea pig with eyes on its belly. Over here, it looks like these sailors have made camp on the back of a whale. This little detail pops up in a number of early illustrations, and it pays homage to the miraculous tales of St. Brendan and the biblical prophet Jonah. Both had unfortunate run-ins with large sea creatures. The prevalence of monsters in maps like these reflect the fears that early sailors had about traversing the ocean. Fearsome sea monsters became a plausible explanation why the sea was able to claim the lives of so many souls. It wasn't just strange animals that early explorers saw, but people as well. In the travels of Sir John Mandeville, a fantastical travel memoir from 1357, the titular explorer documents a strange race of headless men. He described them as, quote, an ugly folk without heads, who have eyes in each shoulder, and that their mouths were, quote, round like a horseshoe, in the middle of their chest. What he'd stumbled across were blemies, and sightings of these strange torso folk stretch well back into antiquity, having first been described by Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder. They've often been found in decorated maps, existing at the margins of the known world. And although the name may have come from a desert tribe in North Africa, very little else is known about the origin of these bizarre creatures. Some have speculated that they could be distorted descriptions of bonobos, relatives of chimpanzees. I guess with their chins tucked into their bodies. The mystery continues. Along with the Blemies, the travels of Sir John Mandeville describes a number of other strange humanoids, from monopods, who hop about on one foot, to panotti, who possess long flappy ears that go down to their toes. But he also mentions a race called Sinocephaly, aka dog people. In a number of world mythologies, dog-human hybrids are a common occurrence, most famously Anubis, the Egyptian god of the underworld. But you may be surprised to know that they feature in medieval Christianity as well. Take a look at this Russian icon of St. Christopher. You'll immediately notice that he too has a canine face. Why? Was this Christian saint a werewolf? No, but it's all to do with a very amusing mistranslation. You see, the original St. Christopher was from the biblical land of Canaan, and so is often called St. Christopher the Canaanite. However, early Latin translators confused the word Canaan for the word for dog, canine. So, St. Christopher the Canaanite became St. Christopher the Canineite. It plays out in English the same way as Latin. Hence, later illustrations as far away as Russia sometimes depicted him as a dog-human hybrid. I've saved the weirdest for last. The strangest of all medieval monsters appear in the margins of illuminated manuscripts. They are collectively referred to as grotesques, and for good reason, they are marvellously hideous. Some of my favourites appear in the Lutteral Psalter, an English book of Psalms from the 14th century. These uniquely bizarre monsters decorate the text, and no one quite knows why they're there. Could they be religious allegories with long lost messages, or are they there to entertain, amuse or frighten the readers? Whatever they are, they clearly inspired the nightmarish paintings of Hieronymus Bosch, who included many of them in his ghoulish hellscapes. I did a video exploring his disturbing artworks, which you can watch after this. Arriving at the end of this field guide, we've covered a lot of legendary creatures from the European Middle Ages. From Tarasks to Griffins, Blemies to Goose Trees, they are all wonderfully strange and really give us an insight into how medieval Europeans understood the natural world. Whilst we might be amused by the inaccurate drawings of elephants today, remember, so little of the environment was known back then, and so the lines between reality and myth were blurry. Even with the first truly scientific classification of animals by Carl Linnaeus, many of these mythical creatures were put into an appendix, a sort of honourable mentions list. Nowadays, the natural world is more fact than fantasy, but it's still amazing and worth protecting. And with so many undiscovered species still out there, who knows, perhaps some of these beasts really do exist. Hey, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this one. And thank you, CuriosityStream, for reaching out to sponsor this video. 
As of this upload, the channel has recently passed half a million subscribers. I'm honestly astounded by this and just wanted to thank you again so much for watching my videos. Oh, and on that note, if you haven't already, why not subscribe? A like and a comment also go a really long way. Season three has just begun, so stick around for more. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.